All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Sergeant Kevin Allen, and I'll be hosting today's media availability with Chief Chuck Lavelle. Thank you all for being here. Um, we don't have any set topics or any special announcements to make. It's just an opportunity for you to hear from Chief Lavelle. Uh, we'll start with some opening remarks from the chief, and I'll have him answer some frequently asked questions that we've been getting lately. After that, I'll open it up to questions, and um, as I mentioned, we'll be using the raise hand feature in Zoom. And if you haven't used that before, you can find it by clicking on the participants button on the bottom of your Zoom screen. You'll see a list of all of us on the right-hand side, and the raise hand button is on the bottom of that column. Uh, I'll call on those who have raised a uh, hand, and our call manager will unmute you. Uh, so you'll probably you have to kind of watch your screen to see when you're unmuted uh, so that you can ask your question. Um, and we're going to try to get as many questions in as we can in the scheduled time. We're scheduled to go till 2.45. And in order to give everyone an opportunity, we're going to ask if there's follow-up questions, um, wait, we're going to hold those until the end. Uh, you're welcome to add follow-ups into the chat, and we'll, we'll get to those as time permits. Uh, so with that, I'm going to step aside, um, digitally anyway, and um, switch on. Chief Lavelle. Uh, so, uh, Chief, uh, we have a few topics to bring up, but to start off, we just want to give you a chance to make any opening remarks uh, to the public. Sure. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate that. Uh, I think we should start off by recognizing that February is Black History Month. Uh, typically, this would be an opportunity for us at the Police Bureau to be out in the community, uh, engaging, connecting with folks, and having further conversations, you know, around racial inequities and racial justice and things of that nature. Um, the pandemic's taken away some of those opportunities from us, but I think it's really important that we recognize the, uh, the rich tradition and, you know, the black community here in Portland has a rich history locally and nationally, and it's uh, very important. So I just wanted to highlight that first right off the bat. And also, um, the Portland Committee on Community Engaged Policing is actually sending out a survey to community to uh, around core police services to get a sense of what the community's priorities are, what they'd like to see in terms of community policing and community safety. So I encourage people to participate in that process too so we get a sense of what uh, what's important to the community. Absolutely. Uh, the main topic of the day is uh, staff reorganization that is effective today. Uh, press release went out earlier on this. Um, so would you talk about the reorganization and what it's about, where it came from? Sure. So this reorganization is, is primarily designed to save overtime. Uh, we're looking at our staffing, our call times, and you know it's a priority for us to be able to answer calls for 911 service. Um, this move doesn't put um, additional officers on the street. We still have the same amount of officers we have. But now our precincts will be able to, to staff without using as much overtime. Um, it was a difficult decision because the places we pulled officers from were doing great and important work. We moved officers from our traffic division, our K-9 unit, our narcotics unit, uh, community engagement, uh, our public information office. And uh, the goal was really to get uh, more resources back to the precinct. But um, I, I do want to just stress to everyone, there, those folks who we did move back to patrol, we're doing really important work for the city, and it's not a reflection of the work that was being done, but it was a necessity to save on overtime. Yeah, and we, um, we're we looking at the lowest number of uh, sworn employees right now. Um, and, you know, we, we want to, you know, talk about, you know, that's, that's, that plays a role here. We're, sure. We have fewer people. So um, you... Uh, the, the changes are not really aimed at an, uh, the alarming rise in shootings and homicides that we've been seeing in recent months. Um, uh, what is the police bureau doing about that topic, though, at this point? Sure, that's definitely a concern for us. We've uh, we've been having conversations for the last several weeks. I think we submitted a plan around Christmas um, of what we could do as a police bureau to kind of address some of the shootings. We've been having regular conversations since then about what's the best way to um, engage in that work. We've had uh, regional conversations with a lot of partners as well, talking about what resources we could bring to bear. And I think it's important to balance the urgency of this crisis, 
but also be thoughtful on what we implement, how we implement it, how we communicate it to community. So we don't run into same, some of the same issues we've had uh, previously. So I think we'll have probably something soon in place, but it's definitely an ongoing uh, regular discussion trying to figure out what the best way is and who has what resources to bring to bear. Okay. Um, and before we turn it over to questions, um, you know, we've had a lot of talk about the challenges here at the Police Bureau. Um, but, you know, given that we're, you know, kind of bringing everyone together, let's, I, I'd like to have you talk about what you see as the most positive things that are happening here at the Police Bureau. Sure. No, I, I like to talk about positive things, so that, that is good. Um, there's a lot going on that, that I think is positive. We, we're doing some great work around equity and inclusion. Um, our equity manager and his team are, are rolling out some new trainings. Uh, we're doing trainings around equity, anti-racism, um, and we're really trying to focus on bringing these conversations to the police bureau. I think having an environment where these conversations can take place is really important. We're also recently able to uh, open our gyms. Uh, uh, to let small amounts of people use them to, uh, to, to contribute to their wellness, and that's important uh, to us as well. We've started our Train the Trainer program around active bystander for law enforcement. Uh, that's an important training that will address um, officers' ability to in intervene if they see something that they think is going wrong. It really puts into practice the directive we have about a duty to intervene. So that's really exciting and looking forward to that. And, um, you know, I think really it's been a tough month because this month we've seen, I think, 38 people leave in the month of January alone. And that's a large number for a, a bureau our size. And we've seen a lot of good people leave um, for retirements and uh, some to separations. But there's a lot of good people who remain here and they do hard work and good work every day. Uh, they're resilient, and I always want to take the opportunity to thank them for their work and let them know that I appreciate it. Uh, the team here appreciates it, and a lot of people in the city appreciate it, too. Okay. Good. Uh, so now we're going to open it up for questions. So as I mentioned before, uh, those of you on the Zoom call, please raise your hand, and we'll call on you for it. Our call manager will unmute you and so that you can ask your question. Uh, so first question is right, Gazaway. Go ahead, uh, as soon as you're unmuted, right, go ahead with your question. Chief, thanks. I've spoken with some families of victims from homicides last year. Some of them feel like their children's case will not be solved due to the sheer volume. Can you tell me how many officers and detectives you have working homicide cases and what you're doing as chief to make sure these families can get that closure? Yeah, thanks, right. Uh, th those cases are important to us. We're doing everything we can to investigate them. We put additional resources in the detective division to address shootings and homicides. We have uh, two sergeants and I think 11 now officers who are working on that effort. Um, we're, you know, we have had a homicide unit that's really built for a certain number of homicides in the city of Portland. That number is probably around 30 um, and their workload has about doubled and we have the same amount of people doing that work. So those cases are important. We're getting to them. There is a, a high volume and a limited resource, but um, we're, we're doing our very best to resource to get the families the closure and, you know, the, the accountability that they deserve. Okay. So you would support getting more detectives in there for this caseload? Yeah, I definitely would. Uh, we promoted seven detectives today uh, to the detective division. And... Uh, my hope is that, you know, they'll, they'll be a help to the investigations that take place. Um, you know, we have right now, as of today, 76 detectives. Uh, we're an agency that at one time had 120-ish. So that gives you a sense of kind of where we are staffing-wise in the detective division. Okay. Um, I am seeing some folks in the chat that are still having trouble finding the raise hand function. Um, just make sure that you click on participants. And then it should be in the column on the right. Um, I see your, your, you've got questions. I'm going to try to get to everybody. So uh, next uh, person in line is Noel Crombie. Go ahead, Noel. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, Chief. I reported over the weekend about an allegation made by District Attorney Mike Schmidt, who told me that a Portland police officer apparently took a screenshot from a mobile data terminal 
showing his home address, and that image ended up on a website operated by a police officer out of state. The DA told me that the incident is, is the subject of an internal affairs investigation in your bureau. What is the police bureau doing in response to that incident? Have you identified the officer responsible? And what do you say about the apparent breach of privacy involving an elected official? You know, I'm, I'm not aware of that particular incident, but um, that's not something that we would support. We take, you know, elected officials' privacy seriously. And, uh, you know, we have an accountability system that we do internal investigations with. And um, I trust that if it's in that process that it'll get looked at and it'll get resolved accordingly. But, um, you know, here we, we take that kind of stuff seriously. We've seen um, in our city where some elected officials have been, you know, the target of protesters and things of that nature. And we, we definitely don't want to be a contributor to that. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, Maxine Bernstein is up next. Hi, Chief. Uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to follow up on that, but I have two separate questions. Uh, let me ask those questions. But um, one is you mentioned the December 23rd report on gun violence that you submitted to the mayor. Um, and in that, you promoted or you proposed having a dedicated team of uniform patrol actually respond and follow up on these shootings. Um, what's happened to that? Have, have you put that in place at all? And if not, why not? Yeah, there's been a lot of conversations since that memo was submitted. Um, a lot of partners have come to the table. And I think, you know, we recognize that this is a regional problem and this is not a solution that the police can address alone. So a lot of the conversations around what resources the police can provide, but also what our other partners can do, um, what other agencies in the local area can contribute. And I think it, it's something that we really need to be thoughtful about. We at Portland Police want to be a part of any solution that's going to address gun violence and keep the community safer. But um, we, we know we're not the only the only agency or the only real driver of that. So we're. We're engaged in these conversations on a regular basis, and I think we're going to come up with something that's um, effective and collaborative to address shootings and bring those numbers down. Okay, my, my second question regards the Cocos, uh findings that the Bureau is not in compliance with its use of force reporting, particularly during protests and reviews. What, if anything, is the Bureau doing to address that and also, just a follow-up to Noel's, uh, you said you're not aware of the incident that the DA is on the record saying an officer, you know, doxed him, but with a screenshot of the MDT. I just wondered how you how you can't be aware of it as chief. Yeah, I, I wish I was aware of everything that happened. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on, and I have a team of people in investigations. Um, who, you know, work on these things as well. And you know, I'll tell you, frankly, I don't know everything that happens everywhere at every moment. Um, if things come to my attention when they get to certain stages. But um, to your COCO question, we're working hard to get back into compliance on, on those topics. You know, what we saw this summer was really unprecedented. Our system of review for use of force and things of that nature as they apply to protests we're not built for, you know, 170-ish nights of, uh, you know, crowd control and uh, mass gathering. So, you know, we, we are looking at our systems, and it's very difficult when you have so many incidents over a, it was a, ended up being a long period of time, but nightly things, and you have to now um, have a system that was built for maybe, you know, one or two or three or four events a year protest-wise, and now you have, you know, 170-ish back-to-back. So we're really trying to figure out how we can refine that, how we could bring more uh, people into the review process, do the reviews more efficiently. Um, but it, with the system that we had was really just not built for what we experienced this summer. All right, thanks. I want to give everybody a chance. Uh, so I'm moving on to Sarah Hurwitz. Go ahead, Sarah. Thanks, Steve. 
Hey, we've uh, talked to several neighbors who are concerned about their safety night after night with shootings, uh, particularly in the southeast uh, Portland area. Um, and they say they feel that there's a correlation between the dramatic spike that we've seen in shootings and the absence of the GR, uh, GVRT. Do you feel that this team should be reinstated? You know, I was sad to see GVRT go away. I felt that they did a really, really good job. They did important work. They did that work well. Um, and I think we do need a, a group of people, a team of some type to address this work. I mean, it's some of the most important work in our city right now. You know, people are being injured. People are losing their lives to shootings. And I do think that we need a comprehensive effort. I don't know if it has to be, you know, PPB uh, led or PPB only. Maybe it's something that's a conglomerate of uh, different regional or local agencies. But I do feel like they, they did good work, uh, that they were a real contributor to keeping, uh, to reducing gun violence. I mean, we still had shootings uh, when we had GVRT, but we had uh, less than we do today. But I think really we look at what's in front of us and this spike and this rise in shootings and we, we need to figure out a, a solution that's going to work and be sustainable in order to address it. Okay, uh, Mike Benner is up next for his question. Go ahead, Mike. Hey there, Chief. Thanks for giving us a, a few minutes, kind of jumping off of sure. Sarah's question there. I am curious, I mean, I'm hearing the same thing about people thinking there's a direct correlation between the disbanding of the unit and the jump in gun violence. What do you think? Do you think there is a correlation? Because if you look at the month that the team was disbanded, mm -hmm. that's kind of when these numbers started jumping. So I'm curious what you actually personally think. And then also, you've hinted at it a couple times now, um, the, that you guys are working on something to address this problem. Can you give us a little more? Because this is top of mind for so many people right now. I think people want to hear from you about how we're going to crack down on this and down on it yeah, no, thanks, Mike. I appreciate the question. You know me, I, I think GVRT as as it was would be helping us, you know, keeping these numbers lower. We had, you know, a focus and a structure. And I think that's pro probably the, the most important thing to, to look at and think of. We had a, a structure that took us, you know, a couple years to build uh, in collaboration with a lot of partners and uh, folks even in California who were doing this work and, and giving some advice. And we put together a structure to help us address what was then a really big problem and is now an even bigger problem. And I think even the loss of that structure has made some of the other people who were combating gun violence has made their jobs harder because they don't have this resource and this group that was out there with uh, frequent contacts, um, you know, to, to draw information from. and. Uh, it made the work of you know, probation and parole and some outreach uh, partners' jobs more difficult. And then you had a, a second part to your question around um, what's being done. And, and this is, a, I know it's a top of mind issue. It's a top of mind issue for me here at the Police Bureau and for all of us. We want to be out doing that work and playing a role in reducing this, but we know we can't reduce it alone. And we could, you know, take officers from uh, patrol or wherever and put them in investigations. We've done that. Uh, we're looking at, you know, potentially doing something else with some other partners or uh, doing, you know, something that's uh, proposed in our memo, but those resources still come from somewhere else and then that's other work that's impacted. So I think right now it's really about how can we build something that's robust enough that brings enough people to the table where we can have resources um, not only operationally, but also um, investigatively. So it's about really trying to build or reconstruct a system that will allow us to do um, the things we need to do with enough resources to not only, you know, hopefully have some uh, deterrent and operational piece, but also have the investigative resources, too, to, to solve crimes and hold people accountable. Uh, there, there's definitely a lot of discussion going on, but I think we're, we're really getting close to putting together some type of structure um, to really employ soon to to address gun violence. Okay, Alex Zielinski is up with your question. Go ahead, Alex. Hey, yeah, thank you. 
Uh, Chief, you mentioned there were 38 sworn officers who, who left in the last month, and, and some of those were separations. Um, did they state kind of why they left? Do you believe that there is a retention problem? Um, and kind of what do you think is the case for such a high uh, uptick in, in folks resigning? Yeah, I think, do we have the exact numbers? I want to say it was 14. Yeah, I'm looking for 14 that. separations, maybe, and the rest were retirements in January or something to that effect. And people have their own reasons, but I think, you know, this summer was really tough on officers. I think um, it was really something that took its toll on people and maybe made them uh, maybe want to rethink kind of their next steps in their career or, you know, maybe some other options. And it's a lot of it is, you know, what's best for, for them and their families, too. I can't say specifically what, what makes people leave, but I think, you know, it's important that we collectively, you know, support our police officers. They go out and do hard work every day, and they're good people, they care about this community, and they want to give good service. And I think, you know, that message was sometimes uh, not at the forefront over the last seven, eight months. And I think, you know, that has its, uh, takes its toll on people. People are human, and they, uh, you know, they want to they want to come out and do their work and, and be appreciated and feel like they're supported. So I think that's that's definitely a factor. Yeah, I think the number that I have, uh, she's she's accurate in uh, going back to July of the last year, 37 or 38 resignations, um, about 73 retirements. So I don't know, I don't have the January numbers in front of me. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, moving on. Um, I know that uh, Gillian uh, Flaccus had a question as well, um, so we'll come to her after this, um, but Jonathan Levinson is next in line here. So, uh, Jonathan, if you can unmute and um, go ahead with your question. I am not hearing you. If you could double check. Ah, I just put on a big show for my living room. Oh, that's uh, okay. <laughs> are you making any changes to uh, use the force policies in terms of like passive active resistance or officer accountability in light of uh, likely falling out of compliance with the DOJ settlement? You know, that's something we're constantly working with DOJ on. I mean, we have regular conversations with them. I think it's important to note, too, that, you know, for the last eight years we've been working with Department of Justice under a settlement agreement to refine policies and training and uh, I think all the policies we have now are DOJ approved so uh, we're still working through that process we make tweaks and changes uh, to those as necessary but that's just a very fluid uh, live conversation and uh, you know my short answer would be yeah I'm sure we're, we're gonna change different policies uh, continuously into the future as you know things arise and things change. Great. Um, all right, uh, Gillian Flaccus, go ahead. Uh, yes, hi, Chief. Um, you know, Measure 110, which reduced the penalties for small personal use amounts of, of certain drugs, uh, went into effect this week. And I'm curious, is your take on that? I know a lot of um, police chiefs and district attorneys and some law enforcement were uh, against it um, during the election. How do you see that playing out? How do you think that will impact the situation downtown right now? Um, and then how will it affect the work that your force does? Yeah, that's a good question. That comes up uh, periodically. You know, that just uh, went into effect, so it's real early to tell right now. But um, it's definitely a concern for me, and I think, you know, especially now at this time where we're taking some resources from our narcotics unit, um, who is doing overdose investigation and things of that nature. And then I think, you know, you, you take into account that the voters in Oregon have spoken, and uh, laws change all the time, and we're pretty flexible, and we have to operate under whatever the laws are. But it does concern me. I, I don't want to see, you know, spikes in overdose deaths. And, you know, we have uh, officers who are adept at going to do that. Now they're assigned elsewhere, so their ability to do that is lessened as well and I think uh, the presence of fentanyl too I think poses a particular problem as well when it comes to overdose and lethality um, so I think it's something we're gonna have to monitor closely um, but it is definitely something that concerns me and it's something we're gonna watch closely here 
Okay, um, uh, Keaton Thomas is in the chat, and he had a question for a while. So, Keaton, if you can unmute um, and go ahead with your question. Great, thank you. Um, I assume you guys can hear me because I'm unmuted. Um, Chief, I was just looking at some of the uh, budget request documents uh, as it relates to the 5% reduction requested by the mayor. Um, can you give me an idea or give the community an idea of what they can expect should the Bureau ultimately need to cut 5% of their budget? And did your guys' announcement this morning as it relates to trying to curb overtime, uh, does that play into a role in trying to reduce costs for the Bureau? Yeah, it definitely does. Um, overtime is one of those places where, you know, you can cut. A lot of our, our money is invested in people, and we want to keep good people here working at the police bureau. So the overtime is something we will look to cut because that's a uh, you know, fairly large number that we can try to whittle down. Um, if we're staffed uh, fully, our overtime spend would be a lot less. And I think, you know, we recognize that the city is going to have some financial impacts due to, to COVID, but we're in a position, too, as an agency where we've lost 110 people since uh, April 1st, and we haven't been able to replace any of them. And for an agency our size, that, that's a big hit. And we know we need to get back to being able to hire. Um, that, that's going to be critical for us. And when you take into account the fact that it takes – about six months to get someone actually hired, and then 18 months of training to get them to be a fully trained, able to work the street by themselves police officer. You know, that's a two year lead time. So anytime you have these gaps in hiring, it's problematic. And as we lose people, if we can't replace them, I feel we're gonna fall perilously short. So um, for us, it's really balancing our desperate need to hire and also being mindful that, you know, the city does have some real uh, challenges as far as budget. All right. Thanks, Keaton, for the question. Uh, Lisa Balick is next in line. Go ahead, Lisa. Hi, Chief. Um, hey, Lisa. How do, you, hey, how do you see a revamped GVRT would be different than what was there before? And what's with the weight, considering what's going on nightly in the streets? Yeah, I think, you know, in terms of our efforts to address gun violence. I think it's really not so much a revamp GVRT. I think it's about how do we do that work better? Is there a way where we can engage in it that uh, we don't run into, you know, some of the issues we ran into with GVRT and, and gang enforcement team prior to that? I think, is there a way where we can improve the way we do that work? Can we make it more transparent? Can we make it more uh, supported by community? Maybe there's some community oversight we could build in. Uh, maybe there's some more partners that can bring things to bear that that uh, make the work, you know, more more efficient. And I think that that's really the struggle and the issue now. I think, you know, the idea people have of just you know reinventing GVRT. I'm not sure that that would serve us necessarily best in the long run if it ran into the same issue. So we want to be mindful about what we can put together to address this that's going to be um, efficient, effective, and sustainable. Okay, uh, we have about uh, two more minutes. I see uh, Jonathan Levinson had uh, one uh, follow-up question. So uh, Jonathan, why don't you ask your question and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, yeah, I just I wanted to come back real quick to the settlement agreement. The, you know, the Bureau's handling of mental health was one of the root causes of it. Can you explain why you chose to make the, the reductions in the behavioral health unit? Are you worried at all that taking officers away from behavioral health might impact compliance for the years to come? Um, yeah, I think that's always a concern. I think, for me, our behavioral health unit was staffed um, one over what our DOJ requirement number was, um, and with the current uh, pandemic, there was, you know, less actual interaction uh, going on between some of the, the clientele and and our members in that unit, and, you know, just looking at our org chart and where you can pull um, 100 people from, from such a lean organization is difficult. So uh, I think every every choice we made of, you know, where to get an officer from was a tough choice. But the Behavioral Health Unit, they do great work. We're, we're definitely um, invested in that work, and we want to make sure that they're you know, equipped to continue that work. It is a big part of our settlement agreement with the Department of Justice as well. But um, yeah, I just want everyone to understand that these, 
these moves are definitely uh, hard made and they're they're thought out as best as can be but it's it's very difficult to look at our organization and figure out where you're going to get you know a hundred bodies to put back to patrol and we didn't even reach our goal of you know our initial goal so we, we took a a number um, shorter than what we wanted because we didn't want to really have negative impacts on the other work that uh, some of the specialty units were doing. Okay, um, we are at the end of our time. I wanted to thank everybody for uh, being here and uh, thanks for uh, coming on. I know it's a challenge with uh, all different topics and being stuff being thrown out, but um, you know, with the demands on the Chief's time, uh, we uh, wanted to make sure that we uh, opened up this opportunity. So thank you all. Um, please feel free to use as you will. And if you have any follow-up questions, uh, give us an email to the PIO inbox and we'll be happy to uh, try to get you answers. So thanks again.